So then, um, we will be here in Wisconsin and Green Bay on this uh, first Saturday. In the days of two considerations, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and then. And say familiarly in this, this epistle, which is for most seminarians is the first epistle that they ever sing when they're uh, becoming um, when they're first allowed to sing the epistle as we say we call them the, the scrub the sub when they're, when they're allowed to sing the epistle in the, in the high mass and that this epistle for most priests, most of the priesthood is the first epistle that they ever sing in honor of Our Lady we out in may non confundator qui per may non ficabum he who hears me shall not be confounded, who works in me shall not sin, who elucidates and enlightens me shall have life everlasting. From the book of Wisdom, from the book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 24. And, so you the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, amen. We're in a great fight, the greatest battle that has ever been. And the same, same war that has always been from the beginning of time. It's not a different war. It's a war between heaven and hell. And at the very beginning of time, the heavens fell. And Lucifer was cast out of paradise, thrown down into hell. And the war was over the Blessed Virgin Mary. And the very first battle also of man... St. Thomas Aquinas tells us, for instance, as regards the angels, that their particular temptation was, or their test, was God revealed to them that He was going to become man, and that He was going to take on flesh, and they'd have to adore Him in human flesh. And when the devil said, when Lucifer, the highest of the angels, said, Non serviam, I will not serve. What was he saying specifically? He was not saying that I will not serve God. Because he knew as a creature of God, he was just created by God, that he must serve God. But I will not serve God unconditionally. I will not serve God who will do something that makes no sense to me. I will not serve a God who will be lower himself to the level of a man. If God, first of all, God should not should not lower himself, because he's God. God should stay in heaven. And in fact, this is one of the secret causes, of the separ one of the secret reasons, why the separation of church and state is so comfortable in the minds, not only of kings. Kings, of course, want to be separated from the church, because the church excommunicates kings when they're bad. So it's normal for kings to want to be separated from the church. But it is abnormal, it is very strange, it is absolutely crazy for the faithful, for the simple people, for the peasants to be separated from the church. You look at the history of South America, it was the great Jesuits and the great Catholic priests and monks who saved all of South America from the great persecution of the wicked kings and of the wicked men that came over to make money and came over to make slaves. The Jesuits formed armies. The Jesuits built cities. The Jesuits built an entire government. The Jesuits taught the Indians how to read and taught them how to use guns and taught them how to fight and taught them how to be an army. And they defended themselves and they created the reductions. And even a pagan author writing a book in 2005 said, it was the greatest government that had ever been created in the history of the world. It was made by Jesuits in South America. The peasants didn't want a separation of church and state because they knew that the, that the Jesuits, the servants of God, wanted them to not be oppressed. It is a unique crisis of our times that not only do kings want a separation of church and state, the faithful want a separation of church and state. 
including in Catholic tradition. Father, you stay in your rectory. Father, you stay in the sanctuary. We'll handle all the rest. We don't want the priest to be in our lives. I remember one time in Phoenix, Arizona, before I was the pastor there, one of the priests was preaching a sermon, coming out of the Mass, and he was preaching about the evil of birth control, the wickedness of birth control. And one of the parishioners who goes to Mass came out and said, one of the parishioners said, ah, no priest is going to tell me what to do. In other places, the same thing. No priest is going to tell me what to do. And so that there is a separation. What is this separation? It is the first separation of pride that was there in the Satan in the very beginning of time. God, you, you are God. Stay God. Stay in your kingdom. Stay above. I am Lucifer. I am the guy who is the highest of all creation. Let me run the creation. And you run heaven. And if you lower yourself, to become a man. This is, this is horrible. And why is it horrible? Because Lucifer will then have to serve a God-made man. Non serviam. Not non serviam Deus simpliciter, but non serviam a God-made man. That's the problem. And specifically also, what is God going to do? How can he become a man? He will only be a true man and a true son of Adam, if he has a mother, and this mother, by her nature, is lower than man, and by her nature, as a human being, is lower than all of the angels, every one of the billions and billions of angels, and the top of all the billions and billions of angels is Lucifer, and this, but this lower creature, this humble creature, who would be the mother of God, she would take her place above Lucifer, she would be above all the angels. This woman, because she would be the mother of God, would rise above all the angels, and she would become the queen of the angels. And this was intolerable to Lucifer. And so the great fight began in heaven 6,000 years ago. And it was the war between the woman and Satan. It was the war between her seed and his seed, it was a war between her who would say in answer to Lucifer, Lucifer said non serviam, and 4,000 years later, she gave the correct answer that Lucifer should have gone, given. Fiat. Let it be done unto me according to thy word. Lucifer should have said, let thy will be done. If you want to become man, let it be done. But instead, Lucifer said, non serviam. Mary answers, the Holy Mother of God, Fiat me, he's a good and bad one to him. And there we are in the great war. We're now at the end of this great war. It has gone through many, many phases, many stages, and always it has been a battle between the woman and the serpent. Always been a battle between her seed and his seed. And always we have been waiting for the same conclusion, which is that she shall crush the head of that serpent. We are now at the end of time. And being at the end of times, we see a much greater intensity of the fight between the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Holy Mother of God, and the devil. We just told the other day of a new movie coming out, being promoted by the Protestants and praised by the Jews, <coughs> apparently coming out very recently or very soon, the Son of God. And part of this movie showing Mary, the Blessed Virgin Mary at the crucifixion, despairing and crawling on the ground and groveling and being horrified at the death of her son. Acting like, Saint Fra like Pope Francis who says that she, she, was, she wondered why, why did you die? And these are blasphemies. And the devil is pulling out his final blasphemies. His final blasphemies, his final attacks. When we, must, we know the truth. The truth is the Holy Mother of God sent her son to death. The truth is she wanted him to die. The truth is she knew that he came to die. Her son was made to die. Her son was, a great, was the son of God who came into this earth for the purpose of dying. And she wanted her son to fulfill her work. 
fulfill His work. That's why she stood at the foot of the cross. To make sure that He died. To make sure that He died for the sins of men. And to assist Him in His dying by standing there. You will obey the Father. You are being obedient unto death. And I am here to be with you as you are obedient unto death. And I want you to be obedient to your Father in heaven. And by the will of God, I have been made the mother. And you must be obedient to the mother also. And the mother also wants what the father wants. The mother implements the commands of the father. The mother does not go against the father. The mother loves the father. The mother understands the wisdom of the father. And the mother helps the father's will be done. And therefore she stands at the foot of the cross. In a war, she is a lay mother of sorrows because of our sins. She is not a mother of sorrows because she wished her son didn't die. She wanted her son to die. She knew that he had to die. And there was a great fight. Because through his death would come our salvation. Through his death would be the wiping out of sin. And she was the one that made sure that he died at the age of 33. She is the one that made sure that he went to death. It was at the age of 30. He was waiting for his mother to give the sign. He had been 30 years at home. I remember one of my parishioners, he stayed in his home and stayed in his home and stayed in his home until one day the mother said, all right, that's enough, get out. <laughs> Time to go. But in this most perfect family, in the most perfect family that has ever been, God wanted his going out to be at the sign of his mother. And the sign of the mother came at the marriage feast of Canaan. And she said, they have no wine. And our Lord said to him, What is that to me and to thee? Woman, what is that to me and to thee? My hour is not yet come. Because once he performs that miracle, he goes inexorably to the crucifixion. And remember, it's a war. We are in a great war. And St. Pius X says, the reading of the seminarians are studying now the encyclical of Pashendi, just beginning to study it. And he says in the very beginning, At all times, at all times, there have been enemies of the cross of Christ. At all times, there have been enemies of God. But in our times, there are many more. There is a greater number with a greater maliciousness. A greater number using degrees of maliciousness and degrees of deception that have never before been seen. That's what St. Pius X says. And then he says, as the pastor of the flock, it is necessary to feed the flock and to guard the flock against the attacks of these malicious enemies. And if I did not, as the Pope, speak out most clearly and expose the wickedness of these enemies and their plots and their designs and their wicked teaching, which, is which has the purpose of destroying all of Christianity and all of religion, I would be negligent in my duties we're in the final war. Now how is this war to be fought? Being in the final war, it is absolutely essential that we be in the arms of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It has always been necessary to be in the arms of Mary. But now it is much more necessary. We must be in her heel, we must be in her arms. We have to be with her. Absolutely essential. And one reason for this is that the devil has too many deceptions. We cannot, we cannot argue against all his deceptions. He's got so many thousands of lies, and we can argue against 500 of them. But we can't go against the thousands and thousands and thousands. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough energy. We don't have enough wisdom to fight all of his lies. And so therefore, it is time for the essential fight. Father Giselle says, in the fight against the devil, the devil has all kinds of fancy moves. He has all kinds of tricks as he moves his arms all over the place. And what do you, how do you fight against him? Do you try to block this blow and block that blow? He says, no. Bang. <laughs> Straight shot. <laughs> do not play the game of the devil by trying to block all of his blows. There are too many of them. He has too many arms, too many legs, too many weapons. We are not fighting his weapons. We are fighting the devil himself. 
We are fighting Satan. And this fight, the fight against Satan himself. We could say to a certain extent that in the previous wars, the previous battles of the last 2,000 years, they have been the fighting of the soldiers of Satan, the fighting of the weapons of Satan. And we've had to fight against the devil through fighting against his weapons, through fighting against his soldiers. But in this final fight, Satan has come into the front line. In this final fight, he's right there, in the very front. And we are not anymore fighting only against his legions, fighting only against his armies and all of his weapons. We're fighting him directly. And the battle against Satan, personally, that victory in that battle is reserved for the Blessed Virgin Mary. This victory is reserved to her. St. Dominic, St. Francis defeated the Albigensians. Who's going to defeat the modernists? The modernists... As St. Pius X says, modernism is the grand, the great synthesis of all errors, the grand sewer of all heresies. All of the heresies are pulled together in one evil thing called modernism. And where all evil is pulled together, where all wickedness is pulled together, that's Satan. He is the one that pulls it all together. Who is going to defeat modernism? Only the Blessed Virgin Mary. Modernism inside of Russia. Modernism inside of the United States. Modernism inside of all the world. The errors of the Russia being spread throughout all the world. These are the errors of modernism. Judeo-modernism. And it is a modernism that pulling together of all these great heresies of all time. Pulled together in one synthesis for the purpose of destroying all of Christianity. Satan himself is there. How are we going to win the battle against Satan? Only by a great closeness to the Blessed Virgin Mary. The scapular was always necessary, but now you had better never be without one. The rosary must be on your person. There should be a miraculous medal. There must be a devotion to Our Lady. There must be the speaking to Our Lady. It is absolutely essential, because in this battle, in this final battle, or this penultimate battle, the victory is reserved for the Blessed Virgin Mary, and she alone can have this great victory. And she says, whoever hears me shall not be confounded. Whoever works inside of me shall not sin. Whoever elucidates me shall have life everlasting. And therefore we see at our times, more than any other time, the devil is terrified of the Holy Mother. More terrified than any other time. Therefore, we must speak of her more. We must love her more. We must push her forward more. We must have greater confidence in her more than at any other time. Because she soon, at the moment of her choosing, shall crush the head of the serpent. She shall convert the Pope and make the Pope able to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Mary in union with all the faithful bishops. She shall give the, concert, the conversion of Russia. We see now, for instance, Ukraine unrest. Obama bin Laden speaking out against Putin. Satan speaking against the devil. And Beelzebub somewhere in the middle. Hell is fighting hell. And they are fighting together for preparing for the dominion of Satan on earth. And the preparation for the coming of the Antichrist. But the Blessed Virgin Mary has different plans. The Antichrist will come. But not yet. It will be later. The Blessed Virgin has different plans. Perhaps this is the beginning of the great fight. We don't know. But perhaps this is the beginning of the great fight which will lead up to the crisis in which the, the, the Pope will be able to convert and then consecrate Russia to the Immaculate of Mary and then will come the great conversion of the world. So we pray that it comes soon. The victory will come. We pray that it comes soon. And, and we must keep a great closeness to the Holy Mother. And this is the only way to have victory in this great fight. God bless you all, and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.